All right, welcome back to Jet Bangers Ball. This is episode 10. We don't really have a guest today. Uh, since it is the 10th episode, we just decided to do something a little bit different. Kind of get into the show, get into the uh, origins of the show, how it happened. Introduce our producer here, Jessica Hundley. And then maybe talk a little bit about my uh, long lost Gibson Les Paul just to keep things interesting. Um, but first, I want to introduce Jessica. Um, I'm not really sure. After eight years, what do I call you, my girlfriend? After eight years of that? Sure. Call me that. But she's, she's producing the show, so she's been on uh, helping get the guests. Uh, get people organized, get people down here to the studio to run the whole thing and, and make sure that the interviews happen and make sure that we get all the stuff posted up on Facebook and get everything posted up on Instagram and all that stuff and make sure everything's scheduled correctly. Um, but Jess, I mean, what, what, what do you think sort of the, the idea behind this show was initially? <laughs> well, as a producer, I mean, yeah, that's your job. Here, you stop right now. All so right. There, there goes the music. We also have Fonzie, our dog, is our in the studio, here. too. So if you, you hear Smell. any pitter-patter of a, a chihuahua's, uh, so there he goes. He's sneezing right now. Or his uh, nails on the floor. That's, that's Fonzie. Uh, the origins of the show. Um, I think, uh, well, my background is music journalism. Um, and you are uh, also have done music journalism as well as A and R, and you're in a band now. And we've both been involved in music our old, for a long time. And <laughs> Fonzie wants attention. <laughs> this is not really the time of the day where he goes for his walk. So now he's. <laughs> hey, Fonz, come here. Um, but yeah, I think we just uh, wanted to uh, do something that uh, talked about all the people that are kind of working in music, not just the musicians, but people who are supporting sure. the scene. Well, I think the idea is that, you know, everyone kind of talks about sort of the death of the music industry and, and we're all such big fans of music and we're fans of the history of music and interested in the history of music and you see some of these bands uh for instance like a led zeppelin or or even a sex pistols or something like that and they have these storied histories and these these monumental things that happened in their careers and then you look at the way things are today with with the internet and and the way things are with just like social media or whatever it is and how the bands have had to like go away from this kind of mythical stature that's created for them and kind of go out on their own and be their own record label be their own publicist be their own uh tour manager what have you just because for working bands that stuff has never really existed. You've always had to kind of do things on your own unless you were at the top, top level financially. But in a way now you, you almost always have to do it because it's expected of you. And at the same time, it's, it's an opportunity for people in smaller bands or running smaller labels uh, to be able to reach people that they never were able to before. Sure. And as much as it's annoying to me to have to fucking post something on Facebook. I got on Facebook literally today. It was the first day. Jed Mayhew has a Facebook. Yeah. If don't find me. Friend him. Don't friend me. <laughs> uh, but today <laughs> I got on there just because it made it easier for me to edit my band's manage, manage my band's Facebook. Thank you for helping me with that. <laughs> but it's just like you, at some point, you have to fucking do it. I mean, you can you can be a Luddite and not do it or whatever, and there's a ton of fucking, like, rad hardcore bands that I like and rad hardcore labels and cassette labels that are still flying the, like, no internet flag, and they also have, you know, their whole thing is, like, you know, 
no sexist, no racist, no assholes, you know, which I used to see on flyers at every show that I went to. And it's like, apparently that's still a thing. I mean, I don't know. They, and they let you into <coughs> these shows? Yeah. The, well, they uh, barely. I snuck in. <laughs> kind of an asshole. Just, I'm kind of an asshole. Not, not a total dick, right? Can kind I come in? Kind of a in? racist and kind, kind of a, no, kind of a sexist, too. Well, you know, I, as a white male, I'm just, I'm just predispositioned to those things. I can't help it. But... <laughs> I just think it's funny that <laughs> it's kind of an aside, but that that's that's still a thing that people are like, no sex. It's like, yes, no, I agree that we shouldn't have that on there. Yeah, um, preaching to the converted. Sometimes it's a bit preaching to the converted, but at the same time, it's also like you know, these are the, the, there are good points as far as like you know how much fucking access does Facebook have to me now? All of a sudden, you know, right. and we'll never, we might never know until. 30 or 40 years ago when we are being controlled by robots or whatever it ends up being. Well, I, I, th I think, you know, it is what it is. It's reality. So, you, you know, got to make it work for you no matter what. It's not 1973 anymore. But I think for bands particularly, um, you know, this is a way where... I think the music industry is alive and well when it comes to the traditional music industry is alive and well when it comes to pop stars and hip hop and there's huge you know there's a lot of money being put into those promotion of those kind of bands but rock and roll um, indie rock and punk and all that is sort of a uh, well circling back to the sort of the idea behind the show is yeah. is that is that all this stuff exists or whatever but. <clears throat> barring that, like, let's actually just talk to real people yeah. and see what they have to say and what their experiences are. Yeah. And so we had, you know, uh, we have on the episode one, we had a record store. We have music journalists. We have people in bands. We have Josh from The Shrine. We had Ty Siegel on. We had Chad from The Meat Bodies this last week. We also had filmmakers. Um, my friend Calvin, who's a filmmaker, and discussing how he uses music in, the, in his films. And then we had a uh, discussion uh, about music supervision, about licensing your music, which is a, a question that a lot of people have these days about how to make money outside of selling records, which mm -hmm. is license your music, you know. So that's kind of the idea behind yeah. the show. Yeah, and I think also for when we do interview musicians, it's an opportunity um, that people don't really get when they're uh, reading an interview um, to really spend a lot of time because, you know, with getting to know somebody. And uh, I think, you know, getting to really hear someone's personality, you might as well take advantage of what the Internet is offering, which is the podcast medium. Right. So thanks for listening. And uh, with that being said, um, I just wanted to talk this week since it is just a different episode and, you know, just if you're, if you're in your car listening or however you're listening, you know, if you just want to kick back and pass the time a little bit, that's how I use podcasts. We, we usually, the, what, the other idea I want to just say real quick is that, uh, you know, I wanted to do this just because I'm a huge fan of the Mark Marin podcast. And I think bands in general are fans of podcasts because when you're on tour and you're bored, you can only listen to so much music um, and, and the thing about podcasts or radio shows like this or whatever is it gives the band something to fucking focus on a little bit when, when you're, you're in the van, when you're driving in a van. And, and if someone doesn't like podcasts or you usually put them on when that person goes to sleep <laughs> and the same thing with like country music gets put on when depending on who's asleep in the back of the van, that's when the podcast or the country music or the comedy album comes out, you know, or sometimes if, you know, everybody likes the same shit, then you just put it on whenever. But I, I've, I, I've watched people, like, in bands that, like, started out, like, hating, like, the WTF podcast and just fucking hating Mark Marin and just, like, ah, this guy's so fucking annoying. Like, after, like, six hours of driving, just being like, oh, uh, can we listen to that interview with Louis C.K. on there? Like, I want to hear that, you know? So it ends up being a good thing to listen to when you're, when you're doing something else. I think that's mm -hmm. what... <laughs> Yeah. Podcasts are for. Yeah. Well, and then going back, you know, my my uh, journalism started with zines and podcasts. Really, this is sort of our like radio zine. Yeah. About this whole world. Right. So that being said, um, 
I had a guitar that was stolen out of our house about two and a half years ago. It was Gibson Les Paul. I had it, uh, I'd gotten it when I was, mm, I guess, 12. And before that, I had had a, I wanted to play guitar. And and I had this friend of mine in, in my school. His name was Dave Lershaw. He was, he was a really good basketball player, actually. But he, uh, he could play gu- guitar and he, uh, he could play one by Metallica and not just the like, do, 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 do. He could play that, but then he could also go into the part where Kirk Hammond starts soloing. <laughs> so I was like super impressed by that. And he could play basketball. He's a really good basketball player too. I think that's what he actually ended up going on to do, but uh, not professionally. Um, but I'm, what we used to do, like after school, was we'd go to the music store and uh, we'd just pick up guitars and plug them in, and that's like that was our first time playing guitar was like actually just like plugging them into to amps at the music store at like acting like we were trying them out even though we didn't really know how to play but he knew how to play so I'd watch him and so you know after a couple times of that I went home and I said mom I need you know I, w- I want to play guitar you know and their whole thing was like okay we'll get you a guitar and we'll get you guitar lessons you know and I was like no nah, I'm not gonna play I'm not gonna there's, there's no guitar lessons, you know, like, you don't take guitar lessons. Like, that's not <laughs> punk rock. It's not heavy metal. <laughs> there's no fucking going to sit there and learn from somebody else. Like, you just have, you just start the band. And you, you start ri- to one by Metallica a lot. You start China. writing songs, and you start the band, and you, like, start playing out, and that's, like, how, how it's done. That was, like, my 12-year-old brain. So <clears throat> she's like, okay, well, we're going to get you lessons or whatever and I'm like no but I do want a guitar so finally I wore her down and found this place in Ellensburg Washington which is about an hour 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 and a half outside of my house where I lived in Tri- eastern Washington Tri-Cities and they had an ad in the paper that said if you come here and buy a guitar up to $100 then we'll pay for your gas for the trip <laughs> So I told my mom, yeah, I was like, look, they'll pay for our gas. We'll go there. We'll get the amp. We'll get the guitar, you know. And uh, she said, okay. And I asked my friend Dave. I said, Dave had a a guitar and an amp. And I said, what what, what should I get? And he said, well, don't make sure you don't get anything less than 75 watts. I got a Gorilla amp. It's 75 watts. So we finally get to the guitar shop. And I go in there and I tell the guy, like, I need a guitar. He hooks me up with this, like, PV Predator thing. It's like a Strat-looking thing or whatever. I'm like, cool, it's a guitar. It's black. That's awesome. It's cheap. I think it's like 100 bucks or something. And I was like, I need an amp. It's got to be at least 75 watts. <laughs> My buddy Dave's got a Gorilla amp, 75 watts. The guy's like, whoa, man, that's, like, that's a lot of fucking wattage, man. Like, you don't need 75 watts. I was like, no, man, I need 75 watts. <laughs> he's like, He's like, dude. It, what size is it? I'm like, you know, it's just like a little tiny practice amp or whatever. He's like, that's not a 75 watt amp. That's like a 10 watt amp. I'm like, Dave said it was 75. I'm not leaving here without a 75 watt amp. He convinces me to get a 10 watt amp. Right. So we get the 10 watt amp. We get the PV. We drive home. So I start playing guitar now in my room every day. I'm playing um, on the PV. On the PV and the Park practice amp. Mm-hmm. Park is, was like made by Marshall. It was like their knockoff brand. This is like brand. in your uh, teenage bedroom. This is my teenage bedroom. You know, it's got the like the Michael Jordan poster on the wall with a bunch of BBs that I had shot into his face with <laughs> BB gun in my room for some reason. Not because I didn't like him. It was just like it was something to do. And so I'm practicing on the guitar. I'm trying to learn "Sabotage" by Beastie Boys. Um, that might have been later, but anyways, I'm learning something like that. I'm learning to play guitar, but I but on my own, without lessons. So I didn't realize for... I was playing every day for like three months and nothing was coming out. It didn't sound right. It just sounded like like clinking and clanging, you know. It I didn't, didn't sound like a guitar at all? No, it didn't. It just sounded like noise. Like, just <laughs> you like, just thought that was your skill level? I just thought I'd, that I would get better, you know. It just sounded like somebody uh, hitting like something on a piece of metal. <laughs> 
that's what it sounded like. I was little did I know I was creating industrial rock in, in Richland, Washington, in 1992. But uh, no, it just sounded like weird metal clanging noise. Mm-hmm. And so what I didn't realize was, well, so finally my mom, after three months, is like, you know, you're not even playing a song. <laughs> You call me into the room, and you stand up, and you play Sabotage by Beastie Boys, but you're not really playing it. You're just, like, strumming along and dancing in front of me. (laughs) So. Barb. Yeah, so my mom. So she's like, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get you lessons. And I'm like, well, I think my guitar is not that good. I think that's the problem. Like, I think I need a better guitar. She's like, I'm going to get you lessons. I was like, well, I think I need a better guitar. She's like, okay, how about this? If you take the lessons, we'll buy you a better guitar. And now this is how I remember. This this is, now we're going back like, you know, over 20 years. But I went and took the lessons. That's a whole other story. The guy was like a big, fat, like, cowboy dude, but he used to be in a hair metal band. Mm -hmm. And he... He taught me a couple things. What I realized really quickly on when I went to take guitar lessons was the reason why it sounded so shitty was uh, because I wasn't pressing the strings down. (laughs) (laughs) You were just touching them lightly on the fretboard? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I was just laying my hand (laughs) on the guitar. I mean, very gently and And somehow. Well, I don't even know how I could even possibly lay it on there that gently. I know. You would think that, (laughs) you would think at some point you would push the strings down. So were you like watching music videos and you just thought that they weren't really touching the fretboard (laughs) when they they were playing? I lived in the middle of nowhere. Like, I did have like MTV and shit like that. Right. But like, I didn't. I wasn't very smart, and no one played (laughs) guitar in my family, so there wasn't any... I didn't know anyone that played guitar except for Dave, and, like, by this point, like, he was playing basketball or whatever. He didn't really care about guitar. Right. I was fully into it. I just didn't know that you had to push the (laughs) strings down. (laughs) So I'm just... So lessons were good. Plucking away. So I figured that out. Anyways, the lessons, they didn't really do much for me. I wasn't that interested in it. Lesson-wise. But the fat guy told you to put the he, <laughs> press on the He had me board. push the strings down. But by the end of, like, taking lessons for three months or whatever it was, I still I didn't really learn much at all except for to put the strings down. My mom decided for Christmas that she was going to buy me a new guitar because I had, like, showed yeah. somewhat of, <laughs> of caring. Some promise. Some promise. Not even promise. Just, like... Some effort. Right. Not a lot, mm-hmm. obviously. Mm-hmm. Not as much as I should. And not, and I was not deserving of that guitar. But maybe she saw something in me that I didn't. So she buys me this Les Paul. It's a 1993 Gibson Les Paul studio. And uh, Did you th- pick it out? Yeah, I picked it out. It was, at the, it was like the one music store that was by our house had it. I think it was like seven hundred dollars at the time on sale, and it was new. But they were like they were like That's thirteen thirteen hundred dollars. Like was mm-hmm. like the retail price, mm-hmm. but for whatever reason, we lived in some shithole town, and they had it for cheap or something like that. It was on sale, but it was a lot of money though at mm-hmm. the time. Sure, it's a lot <clears> of money now. I mean, we we lived in you know up we lived in like an apartment and stuff like that, so we weren't like rolling in the yeah. in the dough. I was the only person I knew who lived in an apartment, actually, <laughs> at that time, w- where we lived. Um, so I get the guitar. I'm super stoked. I remembered, I, I talked about this in the episode with Chad uh, from Meat Bodies, uh, but I re- was reading, like, Guitar World magazine at that point, just, like, uh, religiously always reading Guitar World magazine and, like, trying to learn, like, Slayer songs and Metallica songs out of the tablature that were in the back of there. So you could read music? No, no, no. It's tablature. It's like oh, just right. numbers. So to, oh, right. Okay. Just numbers and Got stuff. It. So Got I couldn't it. read music. No. I still can't. And I still can't. I can barely do the tablature. All the tablature tells you is like where to put your yeah. fingers. But like if you can't actually get your fingers there, it doesn't matter what if the If you're fuck. not pressing the fretboard. If you're not pressing. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so I get the guitar. And I remembered that uh, uh, Robert Smith, and I talked about this last episode, Robert Smith of... Cure, Mm -hmm. had said in an interview in Guitar World magazine, I don't know why I remember this, but this is like 30 
or 20 years ago, had said that uh, people that played Fenders were artists and musicians and that people that played Gibson Les Pauls were assholes. So I didn't, I wasn't necessarily like even that aware of the cure or a fan of Robert Smith, but I'm also 12 years old. So I'm looking at a, reading an article by an uh, interview with a musician. So whatever he says, I believe to be true, whether or not I care about him or not. So I'm just like, well, fucking dudes with less Pauls are fucking assholes. I guess right, I'm a so fucking formed asshole. your identity. I guess I'm a fucking <laughs> asshole now because I got less Paul. I got to act like an asshole. Um, but, uh, so I got the guitar, and I use this guitar now for every... I played it every day. I, I, I had it with me my whole life. Um, played in every band with it. Every band that I played guitar in, I, I played with this guitar. And every show, every recording, uh, I played with this guitar. And a few years ago... So this is... Uh, so you played it your whole life? My whole life. Pretty much. been playing this guitar. Mm -hmm. It has a bunch of... I, I need, it, it needs the frets to be... Uh, leveled because it's I like worn a groove into the frets because it's been played <laughs> so bet. much because you've been pressing because I've been pressing the strings <laughs> down really hard yeah really hard now um describe it for us a little bit well it's, it's a studio model so it's like the kind of the lower grade Les Paul but apparently in the early 90s and this is what they say on the internet I don't know if this to be true or not but they say that this batch of Les Pauls from the early 90s is supposedly some of the best ones they'd made since the like beginning of Gibson or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, apparently the '70s and '80s ones are supposed to be not that great. Um, they have like laminated bodies and they're really heavy. And I guess they they got really good wood and they had really good people working when they built these guitars in the early '90s, which they didn't. Now apparently they're they're shitty again, or so people say. I don't know. So it's a black Les Paul with like gold pickups, you know, which I was never that in love with the look of it either. It's kind of a weird looking guitar, but it, at the time, I was just so excited to have like a real yeah. guitar. I mean, the PV at this point, had, I had spray painted it gold and it didn't play anymore because I had spray painted it. Thought I, I thought I could spray paint it and still play it without like, with just spray painting all over the pickups <laughs> and spray painting all over the strings <laughs> and everything. And just I just basically ruined Right. the guitar and it became like a, a stage prop or something at right. that point i don't know what happened to it so you were in so you started a band though as soon as you figured out how to play yeah the first somewhat. band was the well the first band that i joined was called raven's idea right <laughs> yeah we talked about we talked about this last week too yes. um and, and then you had and that was kind of like a sort of like that wasn't my band so it was a, like a it was kind of a smashing pumpkins mm, kind of yeah. inspired That's the people were like, the, the people were really into smashing pumpkins which i was not that was not my jam at all but you were just happy to play. I just wanted to be in a band. You were playing guitar. I was playing like guitar. second guitar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with with the Les Paul. And then you're at thirteen. Your next band was. That was the Ninja Boners. And were you playing guitar? In playing that? guitar in that. That was I, was. I was the only guitar player. That was like modeled after like Black Flag or something. Mm -hmm. So it was like guitar, bass, drums, and then someone that just sang. Mm -hmm. So it was like the classic. Like we were like you know hardcore punks, you know, yeah. in our mind in, in 1993 in Richmond, Washington. But we were like, okay, hardcore bands are like four-piece bands, you know. It's uh, Circle Jerks, mm -hmm. it's Black Flag, it's Fear, it's whoever, you know. Like Sex Pistols are a four-piece band, mm -hmm. not their hardcore Dead band. Kennedys. Uh, Dead Kennedys are a, are a hardcore band with four Four guys in it. Yeah, exactly. It's the like guitar, bass, drums, like and the singer, singer who's there who doesn't, just to be energy. who just just runs around Bad and brains. goes crazy. Exactly. Yeah. Um. So that was like what visually like what we were going for. So yeah. What are some of the Ninja Boner names? Oh God. Uh, like it was so bad. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we. We would talk about butts all the time. Uh -huh. So we would had a song called Alien Butt. <laughs> And a song called Butt Jizz. And just like, <laughs> I mean, so bad it's not even what did, funny. Uh, what did, did your mom come see the Ninja Boners? Was she proud she'd gotten you? N well, lessons? my mom was uh, my mom was a teacher or a counselor at the local like alternative school. Mm -hmm. And so she, basically what would happen is kids would come into her counseling office or whatever. And they'd say, hey, I saw 
your son Jed uh, and his band, the Ninja Boners, and he was wearing a diaper and covered in blood. <laughs> <laughs> and she would say, no, that's not that's not really happening. And, he, and they'd be like, no, no, I saw him. He's covered in blood. He's wearing a diaper. She's like, no, I don't think so. So <laughs> Wait a minute. You see you were, were wearing a diaper and covered in blood while you were playing the guitar? Sometimes. Because um, I was dressed as an abortion. <laughs> <laughs> it was probably like a Halloween show or something. I don't right, know. Right. You know. It was something specific. And then, we're... yeah. So fast so, forward. So, but let's circle back to what you said before: is that your mom, <laughs> your mom was a counselor at the alternative school. I'm sure that really uh, put a lot of faith into the children who were being counseled by her. That her son. <laughs> <laughs> Just seen her son in a diaper covered in blood dresses of an abortion. There's a classic uh, made for TV movie from the 80s where, like, it's this uh, woman is at a, at a conference where they're talking about how to get people to stop, get, how to get kids to stop being into, like, punk rock and satanic music. Uh-huh. And her son shows up and he's like, she's supposed to be, like, an expert on it. And her son shows up, and he's got, like, white face paint and, like, the eyes black, and his hair's dyed red and all this stuff, and he's wearing the whole outfit. So it's kind of like that. Yeah. Except for I was wearing a diaper and covered in blood. <laughs> I'm sure she would have been proud of you. Anyway. She didn't care. So anyways, moving forward here. I've had, the point is I had this guitar forever. Mm-hmm. A couple years ago, we're living in Highland Park, and I'm living with Lars from The Intelligence. I'm living with Jess, my girlfriend who's here me and and i'm living with bobby who was playing drums in in zigzags at the time and bobby and i had decided at this point that we were going to start our own smoked salt company <laughs> 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 yes you did uh, i believe it was called jb smokes well that was the name of our barbecue company oh, right, but we okay. were also decided we were going to make our own smoked salt. Yeah. That's that was right. that was the that was the big idea that week. A million dollar plan. That was the big idea that week. So that night we Jed is a fine chef, a working chef. But yeah. But we uh isn't that out of the realm of possibility. It is harder than you think though <laughs> to make enough to make money on it. <laughs> it takes a really long time. So that night we were out in the back and we didn't realize how long it takes and, and how little we knew about actually making our own smoked salt. But it takes a fucking long time to smoke a very small amount of salt <laughs> and to get that smoke to stick on there. Mm-hmm. So we were out there drinking beers. Uh, some of our friends came over. We were out there for hours just smoking salt and drinking beers. And finally, we decided to go to smoking sleep. Smoking salt and drinking beers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 so... Finally, we all decide we're going to go to bed. And I lay down and I go to sleep. In the middle of the night, I woke up and saw and like heard something and went out to the garage and saw that our garage door was open. I don't even think we were asleep. I think we were like watching Workaholics or something on Roku. <laughs> Probably watching Workaholics. So I go out to the garage and, the, and it's open. And I was just, but I think I was just drunk. And I just, Went like ah, uh, some and I knew something was wrong with the with the uh, garage door before our, that. Our garage door faced the street. Yeah, and it and it apparently was broken. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so I just assumed that it had popped open on its own, and I closed it and I went back to bed. And a couple weeks later, we were on our way to play a show, and we were loading some stuff up out of the garage. And when I went in there, I realized that they had taken my guitar, and. They had taken some a bass. They had taken another guitar that we had had. They had taken a bunch of Lars's drum stuff. Mm-hmm. And they had taken also my 10-watt practice amp that I also had since I got the guitar, uh, since I got the PV. So I'd had that even longer. Um, so I was devastated, but I was on my way to a show. The reason the guitar was in the garage is because you deliberately didn't want one to bring it on tour or to play shows with That's right. ZZX because you cherished it so much. That's right. I had actually retired the guitar yeah. because I was worried about leaving it <clears throat> at a show and having somebody walk off with it just because at that point it was worth more to me sentimentally than it was to to play it on stage or whatever. So 
I was keeping it at home and not at not the practice space anymore because I was just keeping playing it at home and not playing it at shows and it, and so it got, the fact that it got ripped off then was even even more of a bummer. So we go and we play that show that night, and uh, it ended up being you know it was just one of those things where I had to just fucking get over it and you know I called my parents and they were just like well you know shit happens you know and I was just like super bummed and felt really bad for losing the guitar that my mom had bought for me. So like anything else, you know, like time passes and it, it gets, it gets, you get over dogs that die and you get over, you know, yeah. guitars that l- you lost or things that get stolen and you, you know, you just have to you never really get over the dogs. Well, you don't get die. over them, but it gets a little bit <laughs> or the guitars get stolen. It's it gets a little in the back of your mind. Yeah. And you know, that's the thing is like, I fucking searched for it like once a week at least on mm-hmm. Craigslist for years. Like you, you scoured the uh, rec- record and uh, music shops of York Boulevard. I went and told Mark. everybody at like Future Music and all the music stores that I go to like about the guitar, and I sent out photos and stuff to people online and, and let everybody know to keep an eye out for it. And so... A couple fucking weeks ago. This is now almost three years later? Like three years later. Yeah. A couple weeks ago, I get an email or like a Facebook message from Greg uh, from the band Endless Bummer. He's like, hey, I think this is your guitar. And it's a link to a Craigslist thing. And I look at it and I'm like, ah, fuck, that's not my guitar, you know? Like it's like, I don't know why I didn't think it was, but just like, I was like, ah, it can't be or whatever. And the ad said that there had been a broken headstock on there, you know. So I was like, ah, fuck it. That's not my guitar, you know. And I decided to look at it again. And I looked at it, and I zoomed in on some stuff on there. And, I like, I realized, like, that's my fucking guitar. Because there's things on there that I had put on there. Yeah, a little piece of leather. A little piece of leather that was on the back, like, on the one of the, I guess, the strap, whatever you call it, the little strap mm-hmm. button. I replaced it with a piece of leather because the thing had broken I had replaced one of the tuners that had broken and also like, I mean, I used to just, where I lived, like I didn't have fucking a skate shop to go to or to get stickers. So I used to just cut fucking pictures out of magazines, like heavy metal magazines or whatever, and just tape them onto my guitar Mm -hmm. with masking tape. And then like years later, as I got older, I like realized how kind of dumb that was. So I just would rip the, photos off of the guitar right. and kind of try to make it look like it wasn't, you know, it used to have like a big dead Kennedy sticker on it at one point. I mm-hmm. took that off because uh, that was stupid, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. You, you, when you say you took pictures out of heavy, like a, you have like a picture of Randy Rhodes like taped onto your thing or? No, I had like, like, ra- ra- you know, if it was an article on like Slayer, it right. would have the oh, like the Slayer, Slayer logo, logo yeah, above okay. the article and or I would like cut Eddie this. Eddie from or Iron Eddie Man. from Iron Man. I also had like a photo out of like a porno <laughs> magazine that was like a it was it was like a a guy with like a gigantic penis <laughs> and a woman sitting next to him like holding her like holding her cheek like like, lo- like wow like going like, like ooh, oh my ooh, oh my ooh. Yeah, it's ooh. So like big. looking very pleased by right. it oh okay yeah that was taped on there mm. like on the back <laughs> you know i remember one time like on I, the back yeah it was on okay. the back of the guitar. I remember one time my uncle picked it up to like look at it, and he was like, "He's like this very religious guy, you know." <laughs> and uh, I was like, hey, I, "I don't want you to play that. Uh, can you put that down? Uh, I, don't, I don't like people playing my guitar. I just didn't want him to look at this giant black penis on there with a woman that was going like, ooh." And it looked like it was from like the seventies too. I don't know why I put that on there. Yeah, especially on the back. I thought it was funny. Like just just so you would know it was there when <laughs> you were playing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like when those women put those like vibrators in their underwear and they go to work. It's just <laughs> so they know. That's what it's about. Um, so I don't know why I added on that. I have one on right now. Yeah, okay. Uh, but uh, anyways, so I get the fucking... So it is your guitar. It is my guitar. This is three years later. Three years Craig's later. Craig's Lissad. Craig's Lissad. Greg, who knows guitars, works on guitars uh, of the band Endless Bummer. Um, finds it and remembers three years later, hey. Because he's even more 
OCD about like gear than I am. Yeah. So he was like up in the middle of the night, like looking at like looking for deals on Craigslist. Right. We contact the seller. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had you write him. Mm-hmm. I had Greg write him, and I wrote him, and he never wrote back to me. He wrote back to me. But he wrote back to you, and so we decide to like meet up and get the guitar saying that it's that saying that it's me saying that it's you gonna go down and yeah, get the I guitar said, sure yeah i want to buy it i'll buy it now i'm gonna come down right now yeah where are you where are you i'm on the corner of crenshaw and he slosson gives an Boulevard. address that for those that don't live in los angeles is sort of uh the heart of south central los angeles well it's like you know uh it's like watching boys in the hood or yeah. something if you don't if you don't if you don't live here and, you know, I'm not from here, but, like, in my mind, it's like, I'm on the corner of Crenshaw and Slauson. And I'm like, isn't that where the swap meet is from Boys in the Hood, where they, like, sh- everyone gets shot or whatever in that scene where Ice Cube, like, is like, do we got a fucking problem here? And he pulls out his gun or what? Isn't that where that scene takes place? Slauson, Crenshaw, swap it's meet? also, you know, Friday was also filmed in that area. Anyways... <laughs> That's what I'm thinking when I first hear this. Like that, oh, it's more that, boys in the hood than Friday. Sure, that's where I got to go get the guitars. Yeah, in in from that scene. Yeah. Um, so I was trying to call my buddies and see who would come down there with me, you know, because I'm like, well, we're gonna fucking take this fucking guitar from this fucking guy because he's stolen my guitar, you know. Or I don't know, I don't, I don't, don't necessarily think, think he's stolen it. We could tell by the way the I don't fucking care going. how. He got it, but the, but it was written in a way that made it sound like someone that didn't steal a guitar, but just somebody who was a guitar who was like, nerd who had written the description. Right, but I'm still going down there and I'm still pissed, and I'm trying to get a hold of anybody, and no one will write me back. I'm not encouraging this scenario either. I'm I'm not very happy no. about it. <laughs> but no <laughs> one writes Jed. me back. Yeah, going down on his own. No one gets back to me, so I'm like, fuck it. I'm just gonna go down there. So I get down there, and you know. I I uh I see where I'm at and I start to have second thoughts <laughs> about Wisely. getting out of the car and going up to some stranger's house and confronting them in their own home about a guitar mm-hmm. you know and saying that they that they need to give it to me cuz at this point I didn't he wanted $400 for the guitar mm-hmm. and I didn't really have $400 at the time and I was just like and I was fucking pissed and it was my guitar and I've been looking for it for 3 years so I was going to take it that's what I thought. Yeah. So I get down there and I'm like, I call Jess. I'm like, yo, call the dude up. Tell him you can't make it. Tell him your boyfriend's down here and that he wants to get a hold of you. Right. I get the guy's number. I call him. I'm like, yo, meet me around the corner at the Ralph's and let's do the deal. And, and his name is Mike. That's all I know at this point. His name's Mike from Crenshaw. That's all I know. When I get when I get him on the phone, it's obvious, like you know, that he's a nice guy. Like he's like you know, a white guy like me. You know, like and I'm just like he's like some. And he's kind of dweeby. Well, no, I don't want to say he's dweeby, but he's like a you know he's like a kid. He's you a know, kid. he's a white kid. Sorry, Mike, I didn't mean to say you were dweeby. No, 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 <laughs> no. That's a horrible thing to say about Mike. If it, but uh, so I, I'm like, come meet me at the Ralphs. He's like, oh, I don't know, man. Like. Uh, it's uh, it's not the best neighborhood. Like I, I don't feel comfortable doing like a cash transaction around here, you know. Um, and I'm like, well, you know what? I'm not. I'm, this isn't my neighborhood either. Like I don't really feel like going to somebody's house, you know. Like I want to do it out in the open, just so like we're blah blah blah. He comes down and meets me, and he gets out of the car. He looks like he could be my fucking cousin, you know. I'm like, okay. So I go over there. He starts telling me about the guitar. He opens. I let me. I said, "Let me look at it. I look at it. I look at it real closely. I can see that where the someone had broken the headstock, which sucked, and I could see where the tuner was replaced. I could see the little leather thing that I had put on there. I could see like all the fucking mask or scotch tape that was still in the exact same places that I had put it on when I was a kid. And he gets done telling me about the guitar, and then I say, "Okay, well, let me tell you about this guitar. This is my fucking guitar." It got stolen out of my house two and a half years ago in Highland Park, you know. So I'm taking it. He's like, and he starts to get a little nervous. And he's like, well, I, you know, I paid good money for it. Like, you can't just, like, take it or whatever. I'm like, it's my fucking guitar. I can do whatever I want, you know. And then he starts to get upset. 
And then I got upset and I started to feel bad because now I'm like fucking bullying this kid in the in this parking lot of Ralph's over this guitar. So I don't really have the money at the time, you know, but I'm and I want the guitar. So I said, all right, let me let, I'll give you 200 bucks, you know, and I'll take the guitar or we can like call the cops or what, you know, and he's like, well, I paid for paid for the guitar, you know, and blah, blah, blah. So by this point, I'm just like, fuck it. I just want the guitar back. Like, I don't care about the money. I just I just, you know, as like I said, it's a sentimental thing, you know, I'm like, all right, let's go to the fucking like, where's the Wells Fargo? I'll follow you there. So he gets in his car. I follow him. We get to the bank. Takes a little while. By the time we get there, he gets out of the car, and I'm like, "Yo, man, listen, I'm sorry. I I, I came at you so like hot. Like I was I was just kind of freaking out about seeing my guitar again. And I don't know. All I know is it's Mike from Crenshaw who's got my guitar. I don't know you from anybody, you know. And he's like, "Well, you know, now that I think about it, now that I had a minute to think about the situation." The way that I got the guitar was really kind of sketchy, and I don't want to go too into that, you know. But but basically, the deal was that he had bought this guitar off of a guy that had told him that he had a Fender Telecaster for sale, and when he showed up, the guy pulls out a different guitar and sells it to him. And this and this kid's thinking like, well, you know, oh well, he just has another guitar and it has a broken headstock, so I'll pay for it, you know. Long story short. I get him his 400 bucks. I give it to him. He actually gives me $50 back. And he's like, hey, listen, I don't want to make any money off of this because 350, 350. 350 is what I paid for it. I was going to try to make 50 bucks on it for the hassle of like having to sell it. But, you know, this is your guitar and I don't want to, you know, make any money in it. So thank you, Mike. Mm-hmm. I appreciate that. That was he's also from Oregon, too, which kind of blew my mind, you know. Uh, but uh, and and thanks to Greg uh, for finding the guitar. Not only that, but uh, fixing it. And then Greg ends up fixing the fucking mm-hmm. headstock for me now. Mm-hmm. So the lo- so the point of the story is that uh, well, there's no point to the story. The story is that I got my guitar back. Never give up hope. Well, it kind of blew my mind, and it's like it's made me getting that guitar back. A lot of like weird sort of things that I've been upset about for the last year that I kept telling myself were, like, not that big a deal and that were kind of minor were still, like, really bugging me, bother me all the time and, like, thinking about them a lot, you know, even though they they weren't, they weren't, they sh- I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have been focusing on things. You know, it's like trying to focus on things that you have no control over or yeah. other people or, you know. And when I got that guitar back, it sort of, like, switch this thing off in my brain that made it a lot easier for me to not focus on those things since since I got that guitar back just because I felt like I don't know how I felt but I just felt like if I just focused on m- more positive things coming mm-hmm. You know, it's like, you know, when the universe is telling you like <laughs> that you should change your tampon, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, well, no, I, I think it's sort of symbolic that uh, that, you know, you're about to that the guitar has come back into your life at a point when you're about to make your second record. You're about to go on tour. You're you're doing all the things that you dreamed about when you were 12 years old, not pressing on the fretboard, <laughs> that someday maybe you'd get to do with that guitar. And right. now the guitar is here and back in your life as a symbol of your sort of adolescent dreams come true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I got the fucking guitar back, yeah, so that's awesome. killer. So We also found a dog last week and through Craigslist, uh, found the owners. So the Craigslist is pretty Well, that's awesome. true, and, and we were kind of bagging on the internet a little bit at the beginning, but yeah. like, but it is, for things like, that's the problem. It's like, it does so much horror <laughs> to the world. Like, all this horrible... There's so much beauty as But well. there's, things that you, there's things that are good, like you find a dog, and within two days, yeah. you can find the owner... Because you put it on a, a dog lost Facebook page, and and all and these people start looking out, Craigslist. looking for it, and then these mm-hmm. people see it, and then and the guy gets his fucking dog back. Yeah, you the know? internet. Uh, the greatest thing is community, and that's uh, 
the sort of community that it's it's created, and that's what we're trying to do with the podcast as well. And thank you for listening. And and this has been a a very a very special Jed Bangers Ball. <laughs> Thanks, and I want to thank Jess for for helping out and doing doing this for me and 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 being so involved with everything. Thanks everybody for listening. We'll see you next Stay week. We'll tuned. have a we'll have a guest next week. Yeah. Not us. Not us. <laughs> All right. See you next time. All right. That was that was a different episode of Jet Bangers Ball. I want to thank Jessica for being on the show and producing the show. And our other producer, Nicholas Fahey, for producing the show. We're 10 episodes in. Uh, I don't know yet who's going to be on the show next week, but uh, follow the Instagram. What's that? Well, we don't know if he's going to be available or not. I can't even hear you right now. Follow us on Instagram, at JedBangersBall. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. Uh, as soon as we know who will be the guest, we'll, we'll, we're going to start putting that stuff up there. Um, once again, we're recorded here at the Green Street Studios in Los Angeles. Thank you to This Is Not A Pipe. Uh, and thank you to you guys for listening. And thanks to Greg for getting my guitar back. And thanks for Mike for selling me the guitar and for giving me $50 back. And thanks for my mom for originally buying the guitar. This is Jet Bangers Ball. I'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>